Greetings, this is Griff Ruby, the Nostalgic Catholic, with another Isaac Asimov story review. This one is taken from the um, October 1966 issue of Fantasy and Science Fiction. And for once, he gets the cover in this magazine. Um, it says the name of the story, The Key, a new novelette by Isaac Asimov. But but really, the cover is, does not so much speak to the story as just an honoring of Isaac Asimov himself. So you have these various planets here, and the moon, and he's kind of, you know, it's a rather interesting piece of artwork. It paints him in a way that is clearly recognizably him. Looks fairly good, although it's kind of strange, mounted on top of this weird looking machine with a typewriter and I'm not sure what's going on in here. I don't know. <laughs> the adoring female and the adoring and saluting robot. I'm not quite sure. And then there's even like a little Sherlock Holmes like figure over there with his glasses and a ball of infinity. I'm not sure what the significance of that is. Nothing in there seems to have any clear tie to the story unless maybe they include the little moon in some way. That's about it. So, at any rate, but he gets the cover. Not so much his story, but he gets the cover. It's called the Special Isaac Asimov Issue. So, since they decided to dedicate an issue to honoring him, it just behooved him to take a little tiny bit of tiny bit of slice of time out of his uh, nonfiction writing to give him a little tiny dose of fiction. And so that's what he did. He even managed to do something that hadn't been done in a while, which of itself is, a, I think, a good thing. And that was that, um, let's see here. So, he wrote the fourth Wendell Earth story. Now, I always said I like the Wendell Earth stories. The character remains interesting and fun, and, and there are mysteries and so forth. Um... On the whole, however, I think I have to regard this as one of the less satisfying Wendell Earth stories. But let, let's just let's, let's summarize what the story is and see how it is. So it's on there and it's mentioned here. It's described as a novelette. The key novelette. Isaac Asimov, page 5. So let's put it right up front. But they have a bibliography. They list all of these stories. Um... We've got a lot of stuff in here, actually. There's a, let's see, is that cartoon? Mm -hmm. The cartoon is kind of good, too. So let's see. Ah, uh, it mentioned him in a cartoon by Graham Wilson, no, no less. So, I don't know, old timers like me remember when Graham Wilson used to have a lot of uh, cartoons that were kind of famous and popular. It's the, it's the distinctive style. So, you have these. People gathered around for what is obviously a reading of the will, and uh, there's this robot among them, and so somebody's saying, I must confess that the terms of Dr. Asimov's will are unique in my experience. Uh, yeah, <laughs> probably are. Um, now that he's gone, not too funny, huh? Oh, he would have a little bit of verse called the prime of life. It's undo not doing... Uh, uh, is, is, is free verse. He has those from time to time, but you know, I haven't included that just as I've not included it in nonfiction. So, he had another description and portrait of a writer as a boy. That's his nonfiction story, is kind of autobiographical. So, that he's always had in these things for quite a while now. Um, the bibliography, it lists all these different books. It also lists nearly all of his magazine fiction. Uh, and even includes a few things that, in my opinion, are not fiction. The first couple of 15 million for the, I, for items, for example. Some of the serialized novels, which should just be, as some of them have been, and I hope you get to the others, simply are, you know, they're serialized novels and they're not really short stories at all. You know, even if they may appear in the magazines, broken into three segments. 
but you've seen how it covered Save the Gods themselves and uh, Fantastic Voyage. It is my intention to do the same thing with the stars like dust and uh, the currents of space and the caves of steel and the naked sun. There's all of these stories, you know. They're really written as books, and then they just get serialized in a magazine. That's not a short story. So, almost everything is there. Even the portable star, on the other hand, a few things I noticed something that's not there, most notably uh, that story question. It's like he really just wants to disregard that one. But he wrote it and had it published. It came out in a couple of places. And then it was like that was a big oops. I mean, you can understand why he'd want to suppress it, but at any rate, well, we covered it here, they didn't cover it there. So but it shows the set in a little listing of all these stories. It reads pretty much like a listing of all the stories that I've been doing reviews of. The order gets shuffled around because some of the orders are kind of disputable. So now we get to this thing called the key. And it's very simple. We have this, um, these two guys are on the moon. They find an artifact. And... Apparently, the artifact is obviously alien, and what they find is that somehow one of the guys is able to make it so that it kind of glows and suddenly they can kind of look in each other's minds. And the other guy apparently does not. It seems to have something to do with, you know, warm, friendly emotions or something. And the other guy is this weird party who wants to reduce Earth's population down to just a few million people and so forth. You know, we hear these schemes all the time. We're still hearing them, you know. And, of course, the big ticket question is, okay, uh, so who are you going to kill off? You know? Um, they always seem to have some idea. And, it's, you know, it's either people they don't know or people they don't like. <laughs> you know, I'll just kill off all the people I don't know and all the people I don't like. Yeah, I kill off all the people that are growing things and making things and fixing things. And just in general, making the world work because you probably don't know any of those folks. You know, it's like those kind of you know, totally detached, you know, snobbish rich person who no doubt looks down their nose at ordinary workers and laborers and the people who do stuff as if they're totally unnecessary. Just, just do away with them all. Just kill them all off. We don't need all these extra people, you know. And then suddenly, you know. Nobody washes their clothes. Nobody, you know. <laughs> I mean, nobody grows them food. Nobody cooks anything for them because they're all used to having these things done for them, you know. You know, all, by all those unnecessary people, <laughs> you know. So this guy was kind of like that. But let's let's reduce it down. And they were called ultras. Well, whatever. And. Uh, but it turns out this alien device does not glow and become a source of sharing uh, minds or something if it is if it's held by by anyone psychologically cold and unfriendly enough to be an ultra. So at any rate, he decides he wants to hide it from the ultras is. You know, I mean, yeah, they'd like to get the credit, but he also wants to hide it from the ultras. So he kind of clobbers the other guy who stabs him and he's bleeding to death. But he puts on a space suit and he's bleeding inside it. He hops him aboard a small spacecraft that goes with their main spacecraft that can kind of separate itself and he drives way out a long distance on the moon somewhere or other, hides the device and goes somewhere else and is found somewhere else. And there's this piece of paper, and he left it as like a little clue or a key to his whole little adventure. And they show it here. So this actually has a piece of artwork, which is, by the way, unlike most kinds of artwork, actually reproduced in the way the story gets collected in the Asimov, Asimov Mysteries. So for once, an illustration seen in story actually turns up inside the uh, 
published version of the book as well. So yeah, it's in here somewhere. Uh, yes. in there. Let me go back. So he's had this weird looking clue. And it was kind of the key to where it is, or kind of a clue. And I'm saying this in a way that it would kind of mean this because they decided to take it to Wendell Earth. And Wendell Earth, see, there it is inside there. See, same John. They just copied it. In fact, it looks like they cleaned it up a little bit. The lines are kind of thinner. But it's the same drawing. And what do you have? You have XY squared, then you have PC slash 2. PC divided by 2. Then you have something that looks like an equal signs. Then you have F divided by A or F slash A. You just have SU. And then you have C dash C. And then you have this weird looking kind of an H symbol. A little circle on the bottom. And then the right side is just this arrow pointing to a circle with, with a plus sign inside it. And they kind of come up with the idea that apparently the circle is a reference to Earth. Well, I guess in some places there's a symbol for the Earth that is that. And the arrow is pointing to Earth. It could be pointing to a part of it. Or it could be saying, go to Earth. Which maybe means Wendell Earth. It's like a pun, see? And apparently the guy who was trying to hide this device was known for his puns. And Wendell Earth, and furthermore, it turns out, had this guy as a student, and once this joking bit, this pun obsession of his is brought out, then he's, oh yeah, now I remember him. And Wendell Earth, you know, they, they come up with these various ideas of what the symbols could mean, and this one means this place, and that one could mean that place, and it's all just, we don't know what it means, it could mean anything, and the problem is it really could mean anything. Does he really solve it? Well, he comes, Wendell Earth comes up with this interesting idea. It's like a bilingual joke because it's like a key, and he thinks of some guy that's not referred to in any way in the picture, some guy named Clow, which could be like a German for clue, or it could translate, transliterate into the Latin clav, as in clavius, as in Latin for key. So, who? P. Maybe it's in Clavius. They don't even find it or not, so we don't even verify whether that's right. All that really, really matters, apparently, to Wendell Earth is not whether or not this is where it is. After all, the ultras can't misuse it, so even if it gets found, don't worry about it. But what really makes sure is you need to make sure that you can bluff and rationalize on your feet and make yourself convincingly persuasive to his niece. Brain fart. I'm, I'm sorry. Brain fart. I, this, this, I don't know. I mean, up until Wendell Earth fails to find any real definitive solution that, you know, really fits everything, explains everything, gives you a real clean sense of, yeah, this is really what it had to be. It's all just another, well, it could be this, it could be that, it could be this, it could be that. And what he has is no more than that. It could be this. And they don't even just add to the end of the story. And he looked there and he found the thing. You know, not that, you know, just, I don't know what happened. It was like this was a story told by a, by an Alzheimer's patient or something. You get to the end of the story, it doesn't end, it just stops. So somebody said, okay, that's enough, and the person stopped talking. And, you know, you end up kind of someplace that has nothing to do with where you started. I mean, this hasn't happened in an Asimov story since way back in, uh, I think it was Heredity, where they started with this whole plot device of seeing, you know, uh, nurture versus nature, these two twin brothers, obviously identical nature, but totally different nurture. One city raised on Earth and the other country raised on the farms of Ganymede. And how do these two brothers, you know, sort out their problems? And it all ends with this nice triumph of how these brothers succeeded in getting a, a harvest 
you know, brought into the, the city and so forth. The end. Yeah, what happened to this whole nature versus nurture question? What happened to some characters introduced and connected with that? Just, they're gone. I mean, I think this is the first time since that very ancient story, he does the same thing again. You know, we want to find out where this thing got hidden. He leaves this weird, cryptic-looking bunch of squiggles and marks, you know, symbols or letters and things that, you know, could mean anything, or could mean nothing, or whatever. And we don't come away with any real satisfactory solution. It just kind of comes away, and the real interest really is a matter of persuading his niece, Wendell Earth's niece, which we never even heard about her before, by the way. Just some random... Well, we got to persuade my niece. Well, that's what's important. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Earth. That, that's the important thing. Forget where this thing is. Who cares? I don't know. Is it the story? There's only written four Wendell Earth stories. The first three are really good. And this one starts off well, but it just kind of ends up, just kind of trails off and cuts off randomly. And, I, and I'm sorry. This is... It's definitely not one of his stronger stories. That, that's just all there is to it. You're watching these people. It's an, it's an interesting contrast. I mean, what did it mean when Hari Seldon meant that the other foundation is at the other end of the galaxy? You know? Well, you could take it as, well, the galaxy, oh, the circle has no end. You could follow the edge of it all the way around and you end up where you started. Oh, so it's right here. You see, I mean, you now that's what the, the young girl concluded in that story. You know, there's, there's a rationale. It's still not what the truth. The truth ends up being something else. But, man, it, you know, which also fits. And it had to fit. But this, this was just, it could have been anything. And it ends up with, it can be anything. Anyway, but they wanted to honor him. This is a great issue for that for that reason. And I think there's a lot of really neat stuff about it. About him and about his history and so forth. For, you know, when did you start writing? It's like a little interview. And, um, yeah, but when did you start writing science fiction? He talks a little bit about, a little bit more about his, um, his chums at, uh, what was that, college chums. Greenville chums in college, you know, that he was starting to write way back as a kid. Not that he had any idea what college life was like, <laughs> but he writes it anyway, so what? Um, and he gives a little bit more about the uh, Cosmic uh, Corkscrew story. It was a science fiction short and was entitled Cosmic Corkscrew. The thesis was that time was shaped like a helix and that under certain conditions, it was possible to cut across the coils of the helix. Each coil advanced time about a century so that one could travel a century into the future or two centuries or three, but never say 125 years or 263 years into the future or past. I had, in effect, quantized time travel. And by the way, to this day, I haven't seen anybody use this device anywhere else. The actual plot dealt with a man who traveled 100 years into the future have found the earth deserted of all animal life, but showing every trace of recent occupation in peace and security. There is no hint of any reason or explanation for the catastrophe, and there is no way he could slide back in time just a few days to find out what happened. And then he brings up one interesting small detail. About the only thing I can remember about the story is that I casually mentioned the, the Verrazano Bridge between Brooklyn and Staten Island only I didn't call it that. I called it the Roosevelt Bridge. Well, it can't be perfect. So, that's kind of interesting to come across these little lost tidbits regarding lost stories. Um, how did you become published? Well, it talks about getting into... He tried to write for Astounding. He got his advice from Campbell, but sells his first story to Amazing. And so on. By standard biographical stuff. And uh, what happened to the stories you wrote before you were published? Gone, gone, all gone. Yeah, well, 
We thought 11 were gone, actually. Only 9 were gone because two, one had been published and the other one was somewhere among his papers. So, that's what we have there. It is an interesting magazine and uh, very rewarding. I'm just sorry the Wendell Earth story ends in, in my opinion, a bit of a disappointment. So, that's what I had to say on that.